Cinema Jaw is sponsored by Overcast, an independent podcast app that embraces the open world of podcasting instead of locking it down. No exclusives, no premium content, no paywalls. Just a great podcast app for everyone. Get it for free in the App Store. Thank you. Listening to Cinema Jaw, the greatest movies podcast ever, recorded on location from our respective homes in Chicago. My name is Matt K. With me is Rye the Movie Guy, and sitting inside the fish tank is Phil Me and Phil. How's it going, guys? This week on Cinema Jaw, Matt, we talk unity as we cover our top five favorite movies that bring us together. I love this topic, Ryan. It's been such a divisive time. By the time Jawheads listen to this episode, hopefully we will know who our new commander-in-chief is. Right now, we do not. Um, I, I think this is a perfect time to talk about these kind of movies that I think everyone can agree on. Right. These are films that uh, we see and they, they bring us together. And that's what movies and film do in general, I, I think. Now, not all films, but I'm talking about the grand picture movies. Uh, they bring us together. And I miss going to the movies and laughing with hundreds of people or crying with hundreds of people. But in general, movies bring us together. But these, the ones we're highlighting this week on Cinema Jaw, are the special ones. These are the, these are the ones we all agree on. Yeah. Oh boy, I can't get can't wait to get into this list. Helping us with this list, we have a great guest who's returning to Cinema Jaw. Yes, filmmaker, writer, graphic novelist Justin Zimmerman will be on the show today. Very excited to have Justin back. He's got yep. a new project coming out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, graphic novel that we can't wait to talk to him about. Uh, I think he's calling in from Portland, but we'll have to talk to Justin about that. Uh, in addition to that, we have more going on, don't we, Phil? Oh, absolutely, Ryan. You know it. First and foremost, we're going to keep on rolling with Amy Adams Month. And we've also got some pretty rad Hollywood headlines coming at you later today, too. Not to mention a review of the new thriller on Netflix, His House. Plus, Matt, last week, in honor of Amy Adams, we played, if you'll remember, Illiteration Actress Movie Trivia. I think it's Alliteration, Ryan. Alliteration. Yeah. Actress, you were like illiteration. Like you're illiterate. <laughs> well, this week we're playing actor alliteration. How's that okay. sound? Yeah. Actor. So think of actors who have the same letter starting their first name and last name. Get thinking of those jawheads. That'll be yourself first, Justin. Whew. We got a jam-packed jaw, I must say. As always. So without further ado, we do bring in our guest, Justin Zimmerman, author of The 27 Rush. Crush is coming back to Cinema Jaw. Welcome back, Justin. Thank you. It's, a, it's great to be here. Did I have it right you're calling in from Portland? I am. I uh, uh, am in the midst of uh, Crazy Liberal Central, which I love, and I'm, I'm just jazzed to, uh, to be talking with you guys. I got to get out to uh, Portland, man. I am a big fan of everything that's come out of that city, including yourself, as a matter of fact. Um, how is it out there? Uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable place. We have, we're the epicenter of change and it is the independent comic book capital of the country. So there's so many neat things happening here. Uh, we're obviously on the front page of many new sites uh, in current time, but I think even that is, is healthy. Um, this is a place where people are standing up for themselves and each other. And I think that's, that's important. Yeah, no doubt, man. So, so tell us about the, the new book, The 27 Run Crush. So I'm so just excited about this project. We have been working on it for two years. The first issue comes out in January and the hardcover itself comes out in, in March. And Big Mechs, Big Monsters, a crazy, amazing, awesome female lead um, and just visceral action and just laugh out loud humor. And we're building on the success of the very first uh, 27 run uh, graphic novel, which is offered again, comes out on November 11th. So it's gonna be in short order, the 27 run, the 27 run crush number one, and then the hardcover um, over the next four months. As long as the country doesn't erupt into civil war and chaos, it's going to be a lot of fun. 
I, I have faith, man. We're going to be all right. And, and I can't wait to, uh, to read the new one as well. I'm uh, just, just uh, so excited about your response the last time and just so happy that you're on, on, the, on the team for this one as well. Absolutely. Uh, last time you were on, Justin, we were talking about your short film, Made You Look, and I finally had a chance to watch it. I, I think right when we interviewed you on the last episode that you were on, it was still not widely available on the internet. You were making the film festival rounds and stuff. So what's the follow-up to that? Was that a, a successful run for you? And where can our jawheads find the film? Uh, the cool thing about Made You Look, which stars um, Chris Wayless, who won the Academy Award for The Fly and who uh, created The Gremlins and also uh, stars in his first role, uh, my young neighbor, uh, Kian Doty, is that it's free right now on my YouTube site, which is uh, youtube.com backslash Bricker Down, but also on Amazon Prime as many of my films are. So it's really easy to go check that out. Yeah, it had a remarkable film fest run. Um, just won uh, awards. Keen was able to go to England for the first time in France with that film, which is pretty amazing. And his follow-up won the Gold Key Scholastic uh, Award and was also screened all over the, the country. So he's got big things ahead of him. And again, it was great for him to be on the show and to talk to you guys. He was jazzed about that for for uh, months to come. Yeah, man. It was, it was really nice to get to talk to him. And, and it's good to hear that he's actually continuing with this trajectory. Cause he was, he seems like he's got sort of a, a, a born talent, you know, he's got cool parents. He's got good, good friends around good, cool neighbors, hopefully like myself. And, and he's got a lot of drive. He just watched the seven samurai today. Um, oh which is a three and a half hour, you know, fantastic film. And he's, he's getting into the criterion channel and pretty, pretty neat stuff for a, for a young high school kid. Nice. Good. That, that's great. Um, jumping ahead here with the 27 run crush, when you have a graphic novel like this, um, you, you're probably in the back of your brain, you're already thinking, what if we turn this into a movie? Uh, who would be your, your lead actress in this movie? Oh Lord, you know, it's really hard. And I know we're both, we're all film people, but as a writer, I never think about casting because the character is so alive when I'm writing them that I don't want to try to put that on anybody else. Um, it's so, so that's a really difficult thing for me. I think the more fun question would, would be after you, you read it, um, for you to tell me who you think should be in the, be in the mm -hmm. league. But some of my favorite comic book adaptations uh, uh, cast people who everybody gets mad about because they don't see that person in the role. Heath Ledger Man would Flag. be a great example. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> I'm talking about Heath Ledger where people went bananas when he was cast, but that guy's a great actor and he brought something amazing to the role. So sometimes the people who are most exciting are the people that you don't think about. No doubt. No doubt about it. Here's another graphic novel question because I'm not the biggest comic book reader. In fact, I, I'm notoriously bad at reading comic books. Matt's been trying to get me to read more. If I was going to say, I'm going to pick up a graphic novel, first one I'm going to read, which one would you recommend? What's so cool about the medium is that there's so many different kinds of uh, graphic novels. There's so many kinds of stories that it would, it would be neat to hear kind of what you were interested in in the cinema realm and then try to pair that up with something. But I think the, the two most celebrated graphic novels of our time are The Watchmen by Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons, which Time Magazine said was one of the top 100 novels of all time. So hard to go wrong there. And then Frank Miller uh, wrote and drew The Dark Knight Returns. Those are usually held up as to for, for cinema people and for people who are into the, that aspect of, of, of comics. Those are usually the two that are held up in the highest regard. Gateway, gateway drug, so to speak. <laughs> I like it. I'd toss you a mouse as well, Rye. Have you, have you read that one yet? Have you sat down to read mouse? I have not. It's, you know, listen, it's a, uh, it's a dark uh, subject matter. But it won a Pulitzer Prize. It's you know one of the few, if not, I think the only graphic novel to win a Pulitzer. Um, I think Persepolis might have too. Could be. We'll have to throw that in the fish tank because throw it in the fish tank. I know for a long time because Persepolis is relatively new. Mouse has been out since the early '80s. I want to say, um, yeah, definitely a good one. Have you ever read that one, Justin? 
Oh yeah. I mean, absolutely. When, when we talk about graphic novels in this context, um, we try to, you know, we talk about superheroes and spandex and, and all of that stuff. That's what you see in, in cinema, but mouse is transcends almost the idea of a graphic novel. It's literally a piece of a piece of history and a piece of art in real time. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. No arguments for the jawheads that want to keep their eyes on pre-order perhaps the 27 run crush. Where do we guide them online, Justin? So the coolest thing, of course, is that it's open right now for pre-order on Amazon. Um, and you can see some preview pages and learn a little bit more about the book, get some cool reviews, um, read some cool reviews that are already up and, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a click away. But I also like to remind people that it's a difficult time for retail establishments right now, obviously. So if you can, if you do have a local bookstore, you do have a lo local comic book store, um, it's already up on Previews World. And in as early as the very end of this year, you can pre-order it from your local local shop as well. I know that's not accessible for a lot of people, so Amazon is right there waiting for you. But if you can get it from a local comic book store, I, I would love it. Do it, Jawheads. And we'll have links to everything we just talked about in the show notes. In fact, um, Made You Look is only about, what, five minutes, four minutes long, yeah, Justin? Yeah, it's short. Yep, very uh, short. If, if Jawheads go to the Cinema Jaw website and check out this episode, I'm going to embed the entire YouTube video right in the show notes. Definitely nice. do it. I like it. Um, we said we're celebrating Amy Adams this month, and we didn't read a fact, did we, Phil? Do we got something on Amy Adams? We do. This week's Amy Adams trivia fact Amy Adams has appeared in five films that have been Oscar nominated for Best Picture. The Fighter in 2010, American Hustle 2013, Her also 2013, Arrival in 2016, and Device in 2018. Wow. It's a good crop of films right there. Yeah. I mean, who'd have thunk it too when we first met Amy Adams and her like first little spat of films that she would become this acclaimed actress? I agree. Um, really grown into something. She's one of those where it's an Amy Adams film. Now you're excited to see it. You know, she picks good 100%, projects. hundred percent. And, and I'm glad you, you read that fact, Phil, because that leads me into a question for Justin. Um, Justin, we've been playing this game. We call it keep destroy Spielberg remake, just like kiss, Mary kill. You got the idea, Justin? Absolutely. I'm going to give you three movies and you have to do just that. Keep, Destroy, or Spielberg remake these three. Arrival, American Hustle, Man of Steel. Three Amy Adams heavyweights. Which do you keep? Which do you destroy? And which does Spiel Spielberg make a remake of? So this is easy because we keep Arrival because it's a masterpiece. We destroy Man of Steel because it's not. And who wouldn't be interested in seeing Spielberg try to family up American Hustle? That would be the biggest, it would be like the cats of our, of this year. So bring it on 2020 Spielberg remakes American Hustle for the win. I gotta, you agree with yeah, this? man. I mean, seriously, where else do you go with this? I mean, people, people would just like to destroy man of steel for fun, you know, uh, let alone having to have a Sophie's choice here. Um, I agree. Arrival was something truly special. I don't think it gets enough credit these days. Like there's a lot of buzz right when it hit. And now I don't know how often we talk about uh, Arrival in, you know, regular non film podcast circles. And then, yeah, American Hustle with Steven Spielberg would be absolutely wild, man. He would just do something completely different with, with that. You know, and I say keep the same cast. Just change the director. Mm. So no Tom Hanks. That's interesting. Well, I, I was going to go. Can I use your Tom Hanks joke then, yeah. Matt? Since okay, you, didn't you, can use have, it? you can have the Tom Hanks joke. Okay, I'll, I'll keep Arrival. I agree. It's a masterpiece. I've watched it now, I think, three times, and I, I really love it. And just to be different, I'm going to destroy American Hustle, and I'm going to have Steven Spielberg remake Man of Steel with Tom Hanks as Superman. Nice. That's where you go with Tom Hanks. That's where you go with Tom Hanks. 
This is good stuff. So Justin is sitting in on this entire jaw. He has his top five films that bring us together. We really left it pretty open-ended from there. So I'm excited to see what you guys think are the top five films that bring us together. I, I took an interesting uh, route to get to my five. Um, before we get there, though, we got a good review. Yes, we do, Ryan. A feature debut from writer-director Remy Weeks that made a splash at Sundance finally hit Netflix this past week. Though the spooky season is over, Ryan and I decided to watch this horror drama slash refugee haunted house tale and moved in. But can this thriller live up to its 100% fresh rating or is it just another scare like poison candy? Ryan and I knocked on the door and crossed the threshold into his house. You having problems with the property? This is what they want. They like to see us crazy. <laughs> Let them send us back. How quickly you forget everything we went through to get here. We are not going back. There's no witch. Get down! What is that? Rats. Rats did this. You went outside. This is my house! This is my house! This is my house! house. You don't wonder what it tells me. It says I should be afraid of you. Baal and Rael are refugees who have just escaped a war-torn country in Africa. They have been granted asylum in a rather run-down apartment complex in London. At first, the pair seem happy but haunted by the horrors they witnessed. But soon it becomes clear that literal ghosts have followed them and the walls are full of more than just cockroaches. What transpires is a creepy and scary little gem of a directorial debut. I found the scares genuine and earned. And even when a room is filled with what I can only call zombies, it never felt like the other shoe quite dropped into trope territory. The plot will keep you guessing, and the mystery is satisfying and gripping. I found the twist to be quite unexpected, and Weeks is very successful at making you think you have everything figured out just to upend your entire way of thinking about the characters and story. Horror movies need to have a good ending, and this one really left me thinking about things, haunted, if you will. So I'd call that successful. The acting by the two leads is full of chemistry and role reversals, and I found them both to be completely top-notch. I also briefly want to mention the sound design, which is also essential to a good haunt story. Every creak and whisper is perfectly placed. Perfectly placed. Chef's kiss. Give yourself... Give yourself time for one more scare in November and visit his house. You may just want to move in. I have to admit here, Matt, normally I like to get lost in a movie, full concentration. But with the craziness of the election this week, I had trouble doing just that um, when I sat down to watch his house. Not sure I was able to give it my full attention. That said, I will say this movie has some of the best jump scares I've seen in some time. There were a couple of times I think I was airborne. Yet after it finished, I could not call this a horror film. The drama and the emotion of the film actually overtake the horror element. I was very moved by the end. I've not seen many movies about refugees from Sudan and was intrigued by their journey. The awfulness this couple has had to live through is just too much. This movie is scary, but it is, all, it is also very sad and filled with survival's guilt. I was a big fan of his house. Yeah. We keep talking about the actors. Uh, Wonmi Masaku plays Rail, and Soap Derisu plays Ball. And I'm apologizing in advance if I mispronounce those names. Um, I think the casting was great. We also had um, Matt Smith, who um, sci-fi nerds and, and, and Brits will be familiar with from uh, Doctor, Doctor Who. Who. Yeah, he's one of the doctors. He, he was pretty excellent in here. He's just a smaller role, but he, he is pretty good in here also. Yeah, he's a good actor. Um, but you have to give all the credit really to those leads. I mean, they, they pretty much carry this, the chemistry between them. I'm not sure why you couldn't get into it. So I, I suppose it must have been 
um, just your week, you know, and yeah, not just not, a, just a strange week for sure. Yeah. Because I got into it right away and I, I understand what you're saying about the end of the movie. You can't give it, you can't hang this on the horror hook, but I disagree. This is exactly the kind of movie you want to hang on the horror hook. It's good, thoughtful horror. It continues this wave we're seeing of African filmmakers, both from America and now from, from the UK, making waves in horror, uh, which I think is a great trajectory. And new voices in, in horror are always welcome. And this is different. It's just a little bit different, different enough. And I found that twist toward the end it, to be a bit of a gut punch. Maybe I should have been expecting it, but I just wasn't. Well, I, I'm not saying that it wasn't scary. So I don't want to dismiss this as a horror film. I, it is a horror film. I'm just saying that to me overall, as scary as it was, and as I say, I was, I was airborne at a couple of the, the jump scares. Same. At the end, I actually was really filled with a, emotion, more so than I ever thought I was going to be going into this, this film. So it really, at the end, when I walked out and I, I, you know, I went to bed soon after and I was laying down and thinking about the movie, I, I really was starting to think of it more as the drama. And you know, it's like, almost like a PTSD of what these uh, characters have gone through. It felt like that. And that's what I concentrated more than, say, the jump scares early on. Yes, yeah. I was I was. Geared, but what stuck with me was was the drama was the emotion of the movie same here same here jump scares like it could have just evolved that's what i was trying to get at it, it, it what i was saying earlier it could have just evolved into like some tropey horror movie where there's a jump around every corner even even one like it or especially it part two which i feel was like all those i'm watching this movie through my fingers kind of moments right but it doesn't it, it comes back around with this sort of um, poignant and more haunting than the actual ghost story haunting. It, story. Yeah. And that leads me into a, a quote near the end of the film that one of the characters says, and the quote is your ghosts follow you. They never leave. They live with you. It's when I let them in, I could start to face myself. It's Yeah. You don't get a quote like that in just a, a typical horror film that uh, resonates so much in, in, you know, one line of dialogue. Another really great moment in this movie, um, similar to what you're talking about, struck me a little bit earlier in the, toward the end of the first act, when they're finally kind of realizing that, um, that the house is haunted, right? And the wife says to the husband, you think I'm afraid of ghosts after everything I've seen men do? Ghosts don't scare me. I was like, wow, you know, that's a really interesting attitude. And she, she wasn't afraid of it, you know? Right. Yeah. This is definitely one I'm recommending. Uh, and one I will actually probably once this week is uh, settled down, maybe go back to by the end of the year, because uh, I, I could see clearly this was uh, something special, but just such a weird week that uh, I'd like to give it more attention, you know? Yeah, it is something special. I don't want to talk it up too high. Like I, I wouldn't put it up there with like best movie of the year, like a, like an get out was, you know, it was such an exceptional movie that it transcended genre and became just the, one of the best movies of the year. It's not quite up to that high standard, but is this was a great movie that I totally encourage everyone to see. Movie poster quote. Call an exterminator. His house is infested with scares. <laughs> Decent. What do Decent. you got? I didn't like I went, the title of this movie, by the way. His <laughs> house? Yeah. I went with, you'll be covering your eyes at points and drying them at others. How many jaws are you giving this? Solid three jaws for me. That could go up on a second viewing, but right now three jaws. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. Three Jaws. I'd give it another spin as well and see if maybe it, it ekes out a, a third, th uh, three and a half Jaws maybe. I'm with yep. you. And, and it's, a, it's a tight uh, film. It's only clocks in at like an hour and a half, just over like an hour and 33 minutes. So uh, it's, you know, one that you can spin right. two times. We talk about a lot of horror movies recently, how they build up dread. I think this one just gets right into it. Um, doesn't necessarily need to build up dread because the dread is just inherent to the story. Mm -hmm. His house is streaming currently on Netflix. If you have seen it, 
and you agree, disagree, have any comment with our review, shoot us an email, feedback at cinemajaw.com, or you can always shoot us a tweet at cinemajaw. It's not a movie necessarily that I would have on my top five list that uh, brings us together. No. But after going through uh, a week in which we are electing uh, a new commander in chief and the country is divided uh, so evenly with the vote, um, me and Matt talked and we said, we should do movies that bring us together. This is yeah. the time we need the movies. So we threw that to our guest, Justin, and we left it open ended right there. So, um, Justin, was this easy for you to come up with? Uh, did you struggle interpret it in a different way than, uh, you think we did? I definitely tried to create a, um, a selection from a bunch of different genres. Uh, I wanted to make sure that it was as diverse as possible. I mean, that's the really cool thing about film. You could have somebody We talked about Steven Spielberg earlier, who can, everybody can laugh and cry at exactly the same time when they sit in a theater watching a movie. And that's his master stroke. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. He, he will play you like a, a violin. And you have somebody like Sam Peckinpah, who everybody staggers out of that theater is feeling completely different from every single other person. And so film is so intriguing because you have a shared experience like we talked about earlier, but everybody has their own opinion too. And how that all kind of comes together is what, what a director is really all about. So it was a lot of fun to try to think of, of five movies that would be very different from each other, but also hopefully be those, uh, be those movies that play like a violin. Well, you have intrigued me. What do you got sitting at number five? I picked um, a classic Italian neorealist film called The Bicycle Thieves. It's on oh, the yes, Criterion yeah. uh, channel. You can get it on Blu-ray. And it's this beautiful story about a, a, a father and his son who are very poor but get a job in this post-World War II landscape. And it's a simple... Um, it's a simple story, but it is so moving, so wonderfully created, so wonderfully acted by non-actors, and is just uh, just one of the most insanely beautiful films of, of all time. And I think a lot of people who love cinema have seen it, and a lot of people who are not familiar with, with cinema history have not. So I would love, love for people to check that one out for sure. This one comes up a lot uh, as we as we do these lists over the years. The Bicycle Thieves. It's a, a absolute classic. I still have to catch up with it. Just got to sit down and watch the damn thing. Have you seen it, Rye? I have not uh, either. It's been on my list to watch. Um, blind spot for me as well. So I'm I'm glad as a reminder. Uh, I got to check this one out. Hmm. Got some homework. All right, that swings it over to me. And number five. Um, there's another word for coming together, right? Just, just one word. Um, that word is assemble, right? Oh my God. No. So I am no. going with the movie no. that, that kicked off the entire Marvel cinematic universe. It wasn't the first MCU film, but it was the one that really made us realize that we were witnessing something special and launched <laughs> the series that we would oh, come back man. to every summer, right? Look now it's he is. even even a Rye the movie guy can't help but admit that he gets excited <laughs> when a new Marvel movie comes out. It all oh, really yeah. comes down to Joss Whedon in 2012 with The Avengers. This is a movie that's literally about coming together. It is about the Avengers forming this team of the Earth's mightiest heroes. I have been the comic book nerd reading about the Avengers since my childhood and to finally see them on the big screen played by these great actors kind of made me feel validated. So it, it completed a part of me and try as you may, Ryan, you'll never get me to get off that train. So Avengers is my number five pick. Well, it, it, it already has failed because it doesn't bring me together uh, into the group. You're the so. only person, though. You're like one out of everybody else. So, All right. Um, looking at my list, I don't know how this possibly happened. I don't know what um, coming together has to do with uh, race cars, but I have two race car movies on my list. Herbie Goes um, Bananas? <laughs> no. Talk about Herbie Goes Bananas. Um, going bananas this week. My number five pick is uh, a very patriotic, 
patriotic movie that I think snuck up on me when it comes to the patriotism okay. factor. And that came out just last year. I'm going with Ford V Ferrari as my number five pick. And I saw this when I was up in Toronto um, at the premiere of the Ford V Ferrari, which I'm already like super stoked at that time because Matt Damon's there and Christian Bale and the director was on hand, uh, James Mangold. And you sit down and you watch this movie and I'm expecting it to be filmed great and have these great race car scenes. But what I'm not expecting is to come out of there chanting USA, USA, and wanting to go buy a Ford. But damn it, if that isn't what happened, I was, I was excited about my country and uh, I was thrilled and cheering for the Ford Motor Company, which I never thought I would say those words, but there I was cheering on Ford. And special shout out to uh, Tracy Letts, who plays a supporting role in there, um, who's just hilarious as... Um, I guess it's uh, it, he's like the CEO of Ford at the time. It's, it's right. Did you buy a Ford? I didn't buy a Ford. No, I went Jeep. <laughs> but so it didn't. Um, it wasn't that effective if you didn't go no. buy a Ford. No. But let's be honest. I think everybody, especially Americans, we can get behind Ford v Ferrari. It's a pretty excellent movie. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna give you too much crap. But yeah, it was a good movie. Justin, what do you got sitting at four? Uh, so one of my favorite movies of all time is Fresh, and that writer-director went on to create one of the most unifying films of all time, which is on Disney+, Plus, which is Remember the Titans, which is one of those classic movies about um, sports and race and has just incredible speeches by Denzel Washington, which which anybody could listen to five minutes of, of, of anything he says in that movie and, and be ready to stand shoulder to shoulder with anybody else and make the world a better place. So that I think is one of the most, I mean, that's one of those films that plays you like a fiddle and, and is inspiring, but also very, um, very thoughtful and challenging. So I, I thought that would be a good pick for this week. Nice pick, man. Yeah. There's something about sports movies, right? Especially football movies. I think, you know, you can, you can sit down and, and watch them with the guys and, you know, whoever in your life and everybody can sort of agree on a, on a good sports movie, even if they're not big sports fans. And when Denzel Washington's your coach, you'll run through a wall for that guy. No doubt about it. All right. At number four, I, I knew like when you're talking about uh, movies that bring us all together. So I, I basically crowdsourced this and, and sat my entire family down and and ask them to, to give me some suggestions. And, and oh, this one, or family, no, they had fun. This one kept coming up. And actually when I was doing research kept coming up, I thought maybe it was just too personal and I shouldn't put it on the list because even though I know it's pretty critically claimed, I didn't know if it would really pass muster on this list, but I'm going for it. Um, 2016 Moana, the animated musical. I think again, I didn't want to just go all sappy family films, but this one sort of is a cut above the rest. Yes, it's a family musical. Yes, it's sappy. Yes, it's a princess story, but I think it makes fun of itself. It's self-aware enough. Dwayne The Rock Johnson kind of came out of left field as this uh, hero slash trickster Maui. And they created memorable characters that we all love. I could watch that movie front to back right now and just be as entertained as I was the very first time. And I think a lot of people feel that way about Moana. I know you've seen this numerous times. Probably over I, a dozen. I've only seen it once. I loved it, but I've only seen it once. So for me, it doesn't have that, you know, that feeling of like, oh, I can just watch Moana, like you're saying from start to finish at any moment. Um, but I'd like to go back and watch it. I, I did enjoy it. Justin, nice. have you seen it? I have not seen the Moana. You got to mm. see Moana, dude. It's I think even for adults, like you, you dig it, man. You really would. There's enough. I'll there. tell you what. After you both watch the Bicycle Thieves, I will watch Moana. <laughs> I like it. Deal. It's I a, like it. It's a trade, and I'm I'm 100 percent honest about you. I, I'm with you on this I'm oh. for sure. Also, we're going to throw this into the jaw box. How many times has Phil seen Moana? Matt, you got to guess. Um, I would guess Phil's seen Moana at least half a dozen times, six times. Okay. I'll say three times. 
We'll, we'll throw that in the, the fish tank. My number four pick, I went with a classic. Again, I was thinking Americana. And this is only my, my f- first of two Robert Zemeckis picks. <laughs> Unbelievable. But who doesn't like Tom Hanks? And we all love this trip down American history seen through the eyes of Forrest Gump. Matt, I put you on the spot right now. Do you know anyone who dislikes Forrest Gump? I don't know anyone. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, I was crowdsourcing this with my fam and they all said Forrest Gump needs to be on this list. Oh, they did? They did. That's awesome. Justin, do you know anybody who who dislikes Forrest Gump? I think the movie's got problems. I think what's interesting about it is that- I found them. I found the one. (laughs) I think that's what's interesting about it is it's been largely forgotten. I mean, I, I don't, we're talking about Arrival not being kind of particularly uh, discussed. Um, Forrest Gump was one of those movies that took all the awards and then seems to have disappeared. Well, I think when it comes down to cinematic history and, and you have movies, uh, we've talked about this discussion, 1994's Pulp Fiction, Shawshank, and Forrest Gump all come out. Looking at the history in cinema, the other two, Shawshank and and Pulp Fiction, have fared a lot better. Um, But in the hearts and minds of everybody, and in a list like this, where we're talking about uh, kids like Forrest Gump, uh, older people like Forrest Gump looking through, um, you know, history of it all. And everybody loves Tom Hanks. The story was great. That's why it's on this list. You know who doesn't like, you know, who doesn't like Forrest Gump, Ryan? All the poor bastards that work at Bubba Gump's, the restaurant, where they have that movie just playing on a loop over the bar. And I know because I've talked to these people. They used to come and play ping pong at Streeter's, a bar that I worked at. And I said, well, oh, you must really like the movie Forrest Gump. And they're like, I hate that movie. But they were really good at ping pong from the movie Forrest Gump. Super good at ping pong. And I don't know if that's ironic or not, but that's the true story. Well, that was my number four, Forrest Gump. Into our threes we go. What do you got there, Justin? So trying to keep things uh, diverse, I despise musicals, but I love The Nightmare Before Christmas, which, like you were talking about earlier uh, with His House, the coolest films are the films that transcend genre. So it is a musical, yes, but every song is genius. Every character is amazing. And, of course, from the mind of Tim Burton and directed by Henry Selleck, it is one of the most profoundly cool stop-motion films of all time. So I love that movie, and I love how it brings even people who are scared of things to um, look at the world around them in a, in a different and more kind of accepting way. It's, it's perfect humor, perfect, perfect grace, and, and my, my God, does it stand up. I, it's it's a family tradition for me. We watch it um, right around this time every year, right after Halloween, going into uh, Thanksgiving, and I, I watch it. Yeah, at, when, annually. When is the best time to watch it? Because is it a Halloween movie or is it a Christmas movie? Um, it's a Halloween. The answer, movie. the answer is anytime. You watch <laughs> it anytime. But it is, a, it is definitely more of a, I think, a Halloween than a Christmas movie. Yeah. So I, I think Matt, you're right. Right after Halloween. You know, where yeah, you're November still pretty 1st. close to Halloween. That's a yeah. perfect time to watch it. That's pretty good. This week, essentially, is the mm-hmm. best time to watch A Nightmare Before Christmas. All right, that swings it over to me. And, and actually, Justin, that was the perfect segue into mine because this is another annual tradition. There aren't many movies that get streamed or played uh, back in the old days on television 24 hours straight, again and again and again, and on repeat. But this is one of them. Peter Billingsley in A Christmas Story, which a, another family tradition. Um, the thing, I met Peter Billingsley once on Division Street. He's, he's not that much older than us. Uh, I think we're all around the same age here. Was he playing ping pong? No, he was just hanging out drinking. I can't remember what movie, because he became a director. He, he was just directing a project, and he was just on the street having a few beers. And, you know, I never do this, but I, I had to meet, I had to meet Ralphie, right? And the funny thing is, is like, he almost looks nothing like Ralphie, that little boy, that little cherub that we're so used to seeing every year. But when you look in his eyes, those like crystal blue eyes, it's like, holy shit, it's Ralphie, you know? And it was, it was sort of an out of body experience getting to meet him. 
the the movie is just like front to back pure gold classic that you, you really can't say much about a christmas story i think everybody loves this movie it's a good pick yeah i i, I would find it hard to believe someone would watch it and not like it. Um, my number three, here it is, my second race car movie. This one directed by Ron Howard. It came out in 2013. It lands on this list because uh, it's a film that uh, has themes of, of great rivalry. So you got, uh, you know, two race car drivers that sort of despise each other when they're in competition, um, but they end up, really coming to admire each other uh, through that competition. The movie is Rush. Have you guys seen this one? Still haven't seen it. It's, no Talladega, it's no Talladega Nights, but I, I, see, I, I see where you're going. I see where you're going with this one for sure. Yeah, I mean, again, talking about just coming out of an election when you got two parties um, and then you got to come together. Here it is. You got two uh, Formula One race car drivers, and they're played by Chris Hemsworth and Daniel Brohl. And this takes place in the 1970s, and the two men couldn't be more different. Hemsworth is like a, a, a playboy, and uh, Daniel uh, Brohl plays more or less a, a perfectionist. And um, like I said, they hate each other when they're competing, um, but they also grow to respect each other and a friendship and a bond uh, forms there and it's uh, a lifelong friendship it turns out to so it's something that even though you're competing at the end of the day you can come together rush uh, also do need to mention some beautiful cinematography in the movie there's a, a race scene in the rain that is just gorgeous to look at so uh, if you haven't seen rush well worth a spin opie is a hell of a director man he makes some good ones he does into our twos we go, Justin. So another Criterion classic. This is a documentary. It's called When We Were Kings, which is about the rumble in the jungle with Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. And I've been dying is, to see this. I, I did have see not that. seen it. Oh, it's, uh, it took a while for them to finally do a, a, a Blu-ray transfer, so you're in luck. Um, and it is they found all this old 16-millimeter footage and he is a revelation on screen the things he has to the obstacles that he has to beat the way that he figures out how to to beat the greatest fighter um, of his time after he was out of boxing because he stood up to the federal government and wouldn't go to war and refused the the draft um, so there's politics there's sports there's music because there's an incredible uh Incredible is my word for the day. There's this uh, amazing concert that happens um, during the during the event. It is all about not only watching somebody um, become a, a, a living hero and a living legend, but it also unifies, I think, every single person who would watch that that film in real time. I would love to hear what you thought about it when you saw it. Yeah, that one is on my list to watch. So uh, excited for that one for sure. Yeah, it is. I, I don't know. I don't know a single person alive who doesn't think Muhammad Ali is incredibly inspiring. It's like everybody can agree on that. That is definitely something we can all come together with. Uh, all right. I guess I'm next here at number two. I'm going with a movie that's again. I I wanted to find movies I thought everybody like universally liked but i also wanted to find ones that that have a theme of coming together like the avengers poo poo it though you will ryan uh, <laughs> and this one does as well 90 percent uh of users on google like this movie so no, no surprise richard donner 1985 the goonies which is about a group of friends coming together and I leave it off of so many lists because it's kind of obvious. But if we're talking about a time when this nation is divided and we're all sort of pissed off and polarized, I think we can all get together and agree that The Goonies is one of the best movies that came out of the 80s. Find me somebody who doesn't agree with that statement. The Goonies have to come together, right? To, to, to find the rich stuff and solve One-Eyed Willie's puzzles and save the goondocks. And it's, it's a great story of friendship and adversity and coming together and running from your big brother and the Fratellis. Imagine somebody who's never seen that movie 
going off of that description. <laughs> this is the scariest thing I've ever heard. But really? I, what? I, How would you describe it? No, I mean, it makes sense. To find the rich stuff, play with one-eyed Willie, and <laughs> what else did you say? I, it just doesn't Run feel right to me. Run from your big brother. And Run from your, accounts. yeah, none of, it, none of it feels right to me. It was but a bunch of non sequiturs. <laughs> All right. For my number two, I go with my second Robert Zemeckis pick uh, on my top five. This one came out in 1997. And again, um, talking about uh, two opposing uh, viewpoints coming together, I'm going with the movie Contact. And this is uh, Jodie Foster, Matthew McConaughey. And... um, the two opposing viewpoints that I speak of this time is one's looking at something through uh, religion and the other person is looking at it through the lens of science, uh, that person being Jodie Foster. And yet after watching the movie a few times, I realized that uh, both are right. They come to accept each other's uh, viewpoint. And I think the first time I saw the movie, I completely uh, saw it from Jodie Foster and and the lens of science. And the second time I saw it and watching her journey through this wormhole, um, I, I realized that it could have been a religious experience. And I love that these two viewpoints could get together. And uh, there's a moment in this movie when Jodie Foster is uh, talking in front of Congress. This is after she's gone through the wormhole and everybody wants to know exactly what happened. And Jodie Foster's uh, quote is, I was given something wonderful, something that changed me forever. A vision of the universe that tells us undeniably how tiny and insignificant and how rare and precious we all are. A vision that tells us that we belong to something that is greater than ourselves, that we are not, that none of us are alone. I wish I could share that I wish that everyone if even for one moment could feel that awe and humility and hope and uh, it's great because you you, you can look at it as I did at the first that she's she's a scientist but you hear that quote and you can see it completely coming from uh, both sides you know it's a beautiful movie I love contact any any sort of alien i mean obviously contact is a little bit more highbrow than like a uh, independence day but like a common thread in alien invasion movies is that it brings the human race together once we realize that our petty squabbles are meaningless in the in the face of the you know ever never ending universe anyway common yeah. theme Good and, one. and and i i don't know if uh I just watched it recently. It holds up really well when she goes through the wormhole. And I always say for people who have like a really good uh, surround sound system and, and home theater set up, watch that scene with still, and now this is 1997. So it's, it's already aging here. It's 23 years old and man, it, it's still one of the better scenes to show off a, a home theater system. All right. This is cinema jaw. This is our number ones, Justin, your number one movie that brings people together is. So this is a perfect segue from both of what you were just talking about. It is super depressing that most of the alien movies are about, oh, we hate each other, but as long as we have something we can hate more, we will all come together as a species. But that does seem to be the bulwark of, of many, many films, um, especially in the alien realm. I, for number one pick, went with Steven Spielberg, and I went with E.T., a perfect film one of the most beautiful films ever shot and acted because the kids actually, some of them thought this little ET was a real space alien, a real person. And it's about an alien botanist who gets trapped here and the kids who come together, band together, befriend the the alien botanist and then get him back to his ship, the end. But it is beautiful, profound, incredibly acted, um, incredibly shot, incredibly directed and is a classic because it takes every aspect um, of those kids seriously and it transcends the genre and it is a great film and it is a perfect film to remind us, like you just said, uh, Ryan, that, um, that there are 
things worth fighting for and there are experiences that we should have together um, ultimately. Absolutely. Great pick at number one, Matt. How do you follow up E.T.? I don't know. I was just thinking about E.T. I mean, there's a reason why Amblin Entertainment has that shot of the bicycle flying across the moon. It's just become like a tattoo on our you know, mind's eye. It's an iconic pick. Good pick, Justin. Uh, how do you follow up E.T.? It's tough. But when you do it, you got to go big. And I mean, literally, you got to pick the movie big. Tom Hanks. Big. There you go. That's my number one. Wow. There was no wow. doubt. I, I'm stunned with Are this. Are you stunned? To be absolutely honest. I mean, I love Big. Don't get me wrong. And I love Tom Hanks, so I see where you're coming at. But it, Big just doesn't come off as like the movie that brings everyone together. Hey, everybody, get in the room. We're going to watch Big. No. No? Do you love Big? Josh Baskin? I said it. I do. Yeah. Okay. Justin, wagging your head over there. Do you love Big? I mean... I just can't believe how much you both love Tom Hanks. I don't know. You just call this the Tom Hanks podcast and just move on from there. This, this is, this is incredible to me, but uh, no, (laughs) big big is not a movie that I think unifies the, the audience though. I do love that it, that it is the perfect movie for you. Well, I, I I did want to throw in a female director for sure. I wanted to have Penny Marshall on this list because I think she's tremendous and Tom Hanks, like, pretty much owes his, well, I don't want to say he owes his career to Big, but Big was a major breakout for him, right? And Justin, I'm sorry, buddy. Yes, everybody does love Tom Hanks. He's a national treasure and he's America's sweetheart. He, he's everybody's dad. And prior to that, he was everybody's goofball buddy. Like everybody at some point just wanted to be exactly like Tom Hanks, you know? And for Ryan, it was, you know, the burbs. That, that was... Uh, his Tom Hanks movie. For me, it was big. I think it brings everyone together because kids can get into the power fantasy that Josh Baskin goes through getting to be an adult. Adults can get into it from the romantic comedy angle. And I think there's enough uh, of a heart line through the story and a bit of a message that it almost kind of works as a, a moral tale too. So big, I think there's more than than meets the eye there. Well, as usual, Matt's number one was a Big letdown. <laughs> My big joke was better, Ryan. What do you yeah. got? Yeah. All right. Just letting that one hang out there for a while. My number one, I wanted to go with a classic also, something that I, I, I think uh, warms, warms the heart a little bit, uh, a movie that uh, brings us together. It's about childhood friends, 1986. It's getting old. Rob Reiner directed Stand By Me. Yeah. That's how you do a number one right there, Matt Kay. Who doesn't like Stand By Me? And, um, you know, you got four boys growing up, each growing up differently, um, but they can be best friends for a summer adventure and each teach each other something. And uh, not only is it a, a total blast of a film, but it's one that when you're watching, you could watch with a group of friends, no matter how they voted, you'd all be entertained. This is a movie that brings us together, Matt. I'm not going to argue with you, man. I freaking love Stand By Me. I mean, I suppose like if, if um, The Goonies was Tim Burton's Batman, then Stand By Me is um, Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight. You know, it's, it's pretty much the same story or very familiar. You lost me with that. I gotta, really? I'd, have to, I'd have to write that down and, and read it to understand that. Come on. Come on. That, that was a great analogy, Ryan. You didn't love that analogy? That's an analogy that everyone can agree on. That, that analogy brings us all together. Oh man. Any honorable mentions here that uh, we missed? I can go rapid fire. Um, oh, he's got a, he's got a whole ton of them. He's ready to rock. I am. Well, I mean, Tom Hanks made some more movies. So yeah, let's, let's just list, list, list Tom Hanks. IMDb. Oh, and just... oh, it's not like I had Tom Hanks more than once on my list. Mr. Freaking Forrest Gump over there. Um, rapid fire. When Harry met Sally. <laughs> You're John, joking, right? <laughs> no, everybody loves when Harry met Sally. Wow, all right, go One ahead. One of the greatest romantic comedies of all time. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know why, but I think we can all agree on John Wick. Um, Stand By Me, oh, you mentioned. God. These are... <laughs> <All right. laughs> hey, man, no. I'm serious about that. Princess Bride. There is one. Yeah. yeah. Ghostbusters. It's about bringing the city of New York together to fight uh, you know, evil and whatnot. Um, 
you know, I, I don't know about this one, but Mrs. Doubtfire, it's about keeping your family together. It's a little no. dated, but no. 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 And I know Justin hates musicals, but The Sound of Music is about a family oh, sticking together. Oh, oh man. <laughs> wow. Justin liked me before this podcast. He actually liked Unbelievable. me. Unbelievable. What do you um, got, Ryan? I, I had a, a couple others that I was uh, toying with trying to put on my list. As far as that uh, competition, um, and then turn into friends. Honorable mention, Borg versus McEnroe. Check it out. It's out on Hulu, and it's, uh, it's got uh, Shia LaBeouf playing John McEnroe. Great one. Pixar. Most Pixar movies in general are, are great to bring people together. For my money, if I was going to say universal, one that people just all around love, I went with WALL-E. I think that's uh, for my money. And then I, I went with Life story. Yeah, yeah, Toy Story. Life of Pi, uh, I thought was was pretty damn good. And I've talked about it a few times, the movie Brooklyn. And again, it sort of fits on this list because it's, uh, you know, immigrants coming into the country and uh, a beautiful love story. This Those were my honorable. S- Spike Lee Brooklyn? No. No, that's Crooklyn, right? Crooklyn, correct. Yeah. yeah. This nice. is the one with Saoirse Ronan starring. Any honorables Justin? there, Justin? I was just trying to think again of something that would just be wildly different. And it kind of hits your John Wick a little bit. I was thinking Mad Max Fury Road. Uh, yeah. It certainly brings all cinema people together. Doesn't it? I, I just love the fact that it's about these two characters who are wildly different from each other. It seems to be a common theme who through a massive amount of duress and giant chasings where lots of things blow up become friends and and uh, and allies and it's got some pretty cool subtext too so it was a, it was a, a crazy sixth pick but it was i was thinking about it. nice uh if we missed your favorite movie that brings people together or you just want to talk shoot us an email feedback at cinemajaw.com or you can always shoot us a tweet at Cinema Jaw. What we're going to do is take a break. When we come back, we have some Hollywood headlines to read. Plus, Matt is taking Justin on in movie trivia. Stick with us. We continue our celebration of Amy Adams with this clip from her breakup performance in the 2005 indie smash Junebug. Are you wearing any makeup? Because you could wear more if you wanted to. You're so tall. I'm fair. But I like to experiment with a lot of different looks. Were you born in Chicago? I was born right here, lived here my whole life. My favorite animal is the meerkat. Do you know what they are? They're so cute. Oh, they're, I've got this little charm bracelet with meerkats on it. Do you have lots of boyfriends? I bet you did. Did you ever try out for cheerleading or anything? I tried out, but I didn't make it. I was born in Japan. You were not. And we are back on Cinema Jaw, hanging out with Justin Zimmerman, author of the new graphic novel, 27 Run Crush. But besides that, Matt, you mentioned it. He's multi-talented. Not just graphic novels. He also has a film uh, that is in film festivals. Justin, tell us about it. So this was a personal project of of mine and a small crew, um, basically in... The, in Ohio, there was a giant immigration raid, and um, there was a young man named Gerardo who was a junior in high school, and he was he was picked up. He came over with his folks, and he was six months old. He's lived in Ohio his entire life, and he was put into a prison for two months, basically in a cage within a cage, uh, let loose, and then basically was slated to be deported. So we worked with Gerardo and his family. Uh, We shot the entire film on eight and 16 millimeter. And we got to learn a little bit about him and his life. Um, His sister and his two brothers were born here. So they are citizens. He is not. And just created a, basically a a short documentary. It looks and feels like a home movie because we shot it on film and got that into film festivals, had a, cool little run. And then of course COVID hit. So it's been in the sense it's reach has been doubled because a bunch of film festivals have pushed into the end of 2020 and then well into 2021. 
And because the courts are closed, he is in his limbo continues. He's still slated to be deported, but there's no update. There's no really, there's no way for him to, um, to get, uh, to get help. There's no way for him to stay here. There's no process for him to become a citizen in any way, shape or form. He's now married and has a, his family's about to get bigger and his situation is still exactly the same. So it's been kind of an honor and a privilege to support that film, to, um, to represent it uh, in a number of film festivals, all now online, but hopefully next year we'll get out on the road again and to be a voice for that, uh, that issue. Um, there are, he's just one of so many who are kind of stuck in this system. And it's a, it's a, it's a very different kind of project than my graphic novel work. Um, but um, it's, it's, there's still stories that need to be told. And, and that's, that, that's my film story for, uh, for, for this year. That's awesome, man. That's, that's why I've been a fan of your work. I mean, you, you do tackle a bunch of different, you can go from like a uh, sci-fi giant robots type story and then go to like a social justice documentary and you never know what you're going to get from Justin Zimmerman. It's great. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. I mean, we live in a cool time where you can make a, a number of different kinds of projects and you can get them much more immediately out into the world. And so I worked on projects that have taken four or five years, but both my graphic novel and this film um, within a within two year period are are in front of people, and so that's that's the exciting thing about living in today's age, um, and talking to folks like you who have supported that diverse work and are you know always pushing people like me to to be better. Well said, man. Keep it up. Absolutely, um, Matt. Before you take Justin on in trivia. And before we get to those Hollywood headlines, we did throw a few items into the fish tank. And we know Phil wants to uh, swim up to the top and uh, tell us what we got wrong. Let's open up that fish tank. Wait a moment. It's fish, isn't it? DC, wake up, wake up. No, Pat, it's a giant glass bowl. Hey, get some fish, folks. Who's coming with me besides Flipper here? That's just a second message. That means Luca Brasi sleeps with the fishes. You're going to need a bigger boat. Yeah, how's it going, guys? Uh, So not too many questions and not that much wrong. Actually, I don't think I I don't have anything to correct anybody on, which is um, which is is oh, which is good. I think it's pretty remarkable today, especially. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we just need to be off our game more. Um, that being said, we don't have many questions, but we do got some, some other stuff. So let's jump in. I got, uh, what graphic novels have won Pulitzer Prizes? Actually, I renege everything I just said because I was wrong. Um, so we can slam dunk on me. Uh, Mouse is the only graphic novel at this point to have won a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, Persepolis did not, which, which I had thought. Um, and then how many times has Phil seen Moana? Uh, I, I may also be being wrong here by underselling this answer, um, but as of my current tally, I believe I have seen Moana five times. So I think that's closer to Matt, right? Yeah. Matt said I was within one, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. said three. I have seen it in theaters, uh, on Blu-ray. I watched it once with an old roommate. I've watched it with my mother. And then most recently, uh, actually in the past, I think, month and a half, I watched it with my niece. Uh, so, and if we're counting like album listens to the soundtrack, which I know Justin would hate, uh, <laughs> it's been on my Spotify top 10, like since release. I gotta wow. see this movie. This movie, everybody loves this, almost as much as everybody loves Tom Hanks. Everybody loves Moana. I, I'm gonna see it. It's gonna I happen. love Moana more than I love Tom Hanks. <gasps> <so>. <gasps> Wow. Well, I, I heard that they cast Tom Hanks in Moana too. So everybody wins. <laughs> so while we're still in the fish tank, uh, we wanted to talk about Patreon and highlight one of our Patreons this week on the podcast. Yeah, we are extremely grateful to everyone who supports us on Patreon. And if you guys want to get in on the action, we've actually been doing some cool stuff, releasing bonus content pretty much weekly. We've done a series on bad superhero movies. We have something coming up where we're going to interview each other and you can like hear stuff that we wouldn't normally talk about on the podcast. So 
get in on this. Any level unlocks the bonus content. And part of that uh, bonus, uh, if you will, is we threw out a questionnaire, uh, Jawheads. If you're familiar with the game Mad Libs, we changed it again to movies to get sort of a questionnaire and get to know our Patreons. And we are highlighting this week Patreon Don from Forest Park, Illinois. And we asked Don some movie questions to get to know him better. And he had this to say, if he was starring in a romantic comedy, he would want Katie Holmes to be his love interest. Katie, yeah, yeah, good, good pick, Katie Holmes. She's too tall for me. I think she's like five ten. I, I couldn't go, Katie Holmes. I, as long as he's just not near a sofa anywhere during that movie, I think that that's fine. Yeah, definitely keep sofas People away. People who Katie. love her uh, don't do well with those. The movie that scares Don the most: The Ring. I agree. That face, I saw her face. And then they cut to that, like, just completely twisted visage of that girl in the closet and her face. It haunts me to this day. That movie scared the crap out of me. Justin? Yeah. Ring's a PG-13 movie. I just want everybody to take a deep breath and understand that it's <laughs> not going to hurt you. You're going to be okay, Don. We're going to get through this together. Middle school girls will hold your hand and it will way be... Oh, we shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, that's, you're throwing the gauntlet down. You're saying the ring isn't scary, dude. It's scary, but it's PG-13. That doesn't mean anything. That I also think it's hard. I, it, I don't know if it has aged well for people who, right? Parker will never be able to fear that because he's going to be too easy saying, dad, what the hell is a VHS? Well, maybe that's true. Like, Parker would be afraid of it. I don't know. My, the, the closest thing would be like a Momo, right? I, I, Momo, right. It's very of its time. Momo without the ring. <laughs> All right. Well, Don, uh, we also asked him his favorite Marvel movie, and Don's favorite Marvel movie is Captain America, the first Avenger. Yeah, I mean, Cap, sure. Um, when, when, he, when Chris Hemsworth comes out of the, the capsule with his chest bared and gleaming. Well, it wasn't Hemsworth. It was the other Chris Evans, Evans. Hey man, that's movie magic. I would have left this question blank. I, he was so close to the correct answer is what bothers me is winter soldier to me. Maybe he just hasn't seen it, but Don, I feel like you got to buckle up and strap in and see that one. It's very, very good. It's Don, definitely better than first Avenger. I got to uh, agree with Phil on this. Get a load of this. Don thinks the best sports movie ever made is Rocky. Oh, that's got some Philly. Some, I mean, geez. Pennsylvania's like right it. in the news. It's timely. It's intense. It's beautiful. Come on. Rocky works. Rocky's it, fine. I don't know if it's the best sports movie ever made, but it's a damn good movie. Don's Hall preference is Maggie. Oh. That's just insane. That's just insane. I love me some Maggie Gyllenhaal, but at the end of the day, I got to go Jake. Of course you got to go Jake. And, and I'm trying to think of a good Maggie Gyllenhaal movie, aside from um, the ones that she's in with Jake Gyllenhaal. Maybe he's a fan of Secretary. Yeah, there that you go. That's, yeah. Enough to, that's enough right there. All right, you win. Justin's right. All right. And lastly, uh, we asked Don, what movie title best describes his sex life? And Don said, extremely loud and incredibly close. I really can't comment on Don's sex life, you know, but I'm very happy for you, Don. That's, Congrats, that's, Don. That's, always a, that's always a fun one to answer. We'll have to give our answers to that question at some point, Ryan. Not that yeah. everybody really wants to know, but yeah. maybe it'll I, be funny. My, my go-to was The Force Awakens, but uh, it changes from time to time. <laughs> Mine is the what? nightmare before Christmas. There you go. <laughs> you guys have these. I, it's so premeditated. Is there something that I'm missing? Oh yeah, dude. You you never I got that on Facebook or, or like Twitter. You never saw that question. Uh, it's no. So much fun. It's, it's such been a going fun around one. for years. Yeah. Well, we we uh, had some fun here getting to know our our Patreon Don here. So uh, if you want to join the fun, please support us on Patreon, and we can be reading your answers right here on Cinema Jaw. I think that's everything we got in the fish tank. So, uh, Phil, get back in there. Can you? All right. That brings us to Hollywood headlines, Ryan. Tenant Home Media release announced 
4K, Blu-ray, DVD, and digital versions of Tenant, Christopher Nolan's latest, will be available to purchase on the same day, December 15th. If you want to secure your copy of Tenant as soon as possible, pre-ordering from both physical and digital retailers begins November 10th. I'm a little shocked that uh, there wasn't a, a video on demand window um, here. It, this is extremely traditional uh, of following the, the theatrical release and then doing this whole digital and, and Blu-ray and 4K as, as such. But in this case, a tenant, I actually did think after it left the theaters, they would probably do maybe a month's worth of just video on demand before they went to the standard home release listen i love christopher nolan i have mucho respect i'm a fan i didn't like dunkirk but that aside i think he's one of the greatest living filmmakers today but he's been way too precious about tenant and and he's just wrong like this year i, I suppose i understand what he was trying to do but it became clear pretty early that it wasn't going to happen and he should have pivoted and adjusted. And yeah, I agree with you, Ryan, this should be on VOD. It should have been on VOD in like August. All right. Here's the next one, fellas. The rights to daredevil will reportedly revert to Marvel at the end of this month, meaning that the MCU can finally use him in future movie projects. So now Ben Affleck's going to be part of the MCU. <laughs> Sure, why not? I, I'm sure they'll recast him, Ryan. I don't know if you can recast him. I mean, when, when you play an iconic role like that and you're just absolutely made perfectly for that character like Ben Affleck was with Daredevil, I don't think you can ever recast it. I mean, he is Daredevil in everybody's eyes. I, I mean, listen, man, I, he might be a little too old at this point, but I, I don't think he was terrible as the character. There were way other... There were bigger problems with that movie than the casting of Ben Affleck. Well, I hope my sarcasm came through there. It, it did. It did. All right. Get, here's the next one. New data has shown the Borat sequel had an impressive debut, beating out all but one of 2020's streaming titles. I wonder what that one streaming title was. According I thought you were going to say it. Well, oh, well I might hang on. According to a chart from Variety, the film with the biggest streaming debut of 2020 was Disney Plus's Hamilton. Borat's subsequent movie film came in second on the chart, while My Spy and Extraction filled in the third and fourth place slots, respectively. Justin, you must be stoked to hear how well Hamilton did. I have never seen it. Me neither. <laughs> it's excellent. I don't know what you guys are doing. It's, it's a phenomenon. Phenomenon. My kids love it. It's so like good. Four, it's like four hours long. It's not that long. It's pretty it's close. enjoyable. Crack a beer open and enjoy it. That's another That's, one. You, you could almost say Hamilton is, is a, a movie that brings us together. So Hamilton is about... That fit this list. It's, it's about like American history, right? Like these are all... <laughs> yes. Alexander Hamilton. Yes. Okay, one fine, of the, fine, fine. Yeah. Can, can I just rewatch 1776 instead, which is far superior, I'm betting? No, it's not. I love 1776. Yeah. Watch Hamilton, Matt. I, I would love to see this movie, but I agree. I sit down and I'm not quite sure I have it in me for the three and a half hours of singing. Nothing against the remarkable writing, but you know me. I'm just, maybe it's Tom Hanks was in it. <laughs> Boy, we got to have Justin back on next time we cover musicals. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm going to be a blast. You're going to love everything I have to say for sure. I'll use this tone of voice too. Oh, man. Good he, times. We'll bring him back for Christmas musicals, and he can't do Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah, oh, yeah. Just painful. Top five. Just painful. It's just be me crying for half an hour. <laughs> it's not going to be fun for anybody. Uh, well, we want to we wanna do the stuff that brings us together this episode. So I'm going to end the Hollywood headlines right there. That's all I got, Ryan. That's fine, because you know what else brings us together, Matt? movie trivia you hear the music playing and everybody listening loves movie trivia and that's how we like to end this podcast in honor of amy adams who we're celebrating all this month you heard facts this episode you heard a clip from her this episode uh we are playing actor alliteration so think of actors with the same letter starting their first name and last name 
Justin, you're our guest. You get to choose if you want to go first, let Matt K go first. There are steals, and if you get hung up on any questions, you get one rescue, rescue me, Ryan. They start I'm a, off easy. I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna jump in straight away. Let's do this thing. Question one over to Justin. Here we go. Actor alliteration. Here we go. This actor starred in The Natural, The Sting, and All the President's Men. Oh, Robert Redford. There we go. He is on the board one to nothing, Justin. Question two over to Matt K. Matt, Mm -hmm. this director broke onto the scene when his 1989 documentary, Roger and Me, became a hit. Uh, in, in In my heavier glasses wearing days, I hate to admit that I kind of resemble this man, uh, Michael Moore. Oh, yes, you did. Yes, you did. I've lost, I've lost some pounds since then. Man, I'll never forget we were looking at a, a photo of Matt. <laughs> we were at C2E2, and uh, we were looking at a photo. And I remember Elias, our old producer, pointed it out. <laughs> he said, you look just <laughs> like Michael Moore. I Dude. think I laughed for 45 minutes. I couldn't get it out of my head how much you look like Michael Moore. If, if, if I put on the pounds again and donned the glasses, I could do a Michael Moore cosplay. Because I always wear ratty old hats, too. Yeah. I mean, I, after, proud of it, after he pointed it out, I noticed people on the floor of C2E2 sort of like looking like, oh my God, is that Michael Moore? It was that spot on. <laughs> All right. Next question. Right. Question three, back over to Justin. Justin, how many times has Sylvester Stallone portrayed Rocky Balboa in a feature film? God, what's he up to now? Is it six? Is that your final answer? I want to wink if it's if it's a good or not. Give me a little hint. No, I can't. No, no. Poker uh, face. Poker face from Ryan over there. It's five or six. I'm going to say five because I'm scared now. Incorrect. Oh. You got a chance for a steal here. How many times has Sylvester Stallone played Rocky Balboa in a feature film? Well, it's funny because it me- immediately makes me think of the fake commercial in Spaceballs where they make fun of Rocky Five thousand um and i think that's actually a low number now he's i think he's past six we had the first three the last one was with tommy the first one he fights clubber lang then apollo creed and then he fights ivan drago then he fights tommy gunn in the fourth one i think he did a really crappy comeback from that and then we had we're not counting creed right well, he said it portray him, so it's a trick question. So oh, okay, so we are counting yeah. Creed. Yeah, now I think, yep. Okay, so so we had the, the Rocky comeback, just Balboa, so that's six. He was in Creed and then the Creed sequel, so I think he's up to eight. That is correct. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Eight times Rocky Balboa has graced the, the silver screen. That's um, insane. <laughs> Holy crap. It is uh, now... Two to one, Matt K, and question four is over to him. Matt, name the actor who starred in Just Friends, The Proposal, and Six Underground. You said actor, right? Yes, because we're playing actor. Ryan Reynolds. Wow, Matt is on a roll. You you don't get a Ryan Reynolds question past this guy, I swear (laughs) to God. (laughs) Um, so we're, we're currently sitting now three to one, Matt K question five back over to Justin, Uh Justin, the great Steven Seagal has made one movie with the fabulous Kurt Russell. It came out in 1996. Name that movie with Kurt Russell, Steven Seagal and Kurt Russell. I can't believe I don't, I haven't seen this. I don't know what it is. And right after Moana, I'm going to go watch it. (laughs) That is incorrect. Um, I'm racking my brain too. I'm sorry. I'm like, did John Carpenter put him in escape from. Oh, I know what it is. Oh, I know what it is. We jump back to Justin. He's our guest. We're going to let him. Oh, it's, it's sweet of you. Uh, It's executive. Yes. Something decision executive. There it is. Oh, yes. Nailed it. 
I and wouldn't he, have gotten he, it. I wouldn't have gotten it. No, Didn't we'll he die like really early in the in the thing? Way yeah, to I spoil think. it for everybody, Justin. Yes, he, Steven Seagal did die. <laughs> when did he come early. out? They, they they've been around for a while. Come on, Plus, nobody's going to. <laughs> nobody's going to see that movie. <laughs> But to be honest, that was the surprise of that movie because Seagal was uh, billed as a star. I mean, at that time, he was still a very big star, and he dies about 15 minutes into the movie, which was shocking. But I remember the theater was applauding. Um, all right, here we are. It's three to two. Justin crawled back into it. Question six, back over to Matt K. Matt, name the actor who last year appeared in the live-action remake of Dumbo and in Jumanji, the next level. Okay, well, Jumanji, the next level has a pretty small cast. Oh, man. Oh, wait a second. This is a Hanks question. This is Colin Hanks. Colin Hanks. <laughs> I don't know what the hell you're thinking. <laughs> wait, he's in Jumanji, right? He's the guy that was stuck there that they oh. have to rescue. It, maybe he does pop up in there. The late Jawbox or Fish Tank on that one. Maybe he pops up. He's in the in the game. I think you're right on that. But you're incorrect on your answer. Remember, we're playing actor alliteration. Um, so that is incorrect. Mm. Justin, you got a chance for a steal. An actor that appeared in Jumanji, the next level, and also the live action Dumbo. I have not seen either of those films. So I'm sadly going to have to lose my opportunity here. That is also incorrect. We're looking for Danny DeVito. Danny DeVito is in both films. Mm. Here it stands. Both players, for some reason, kept their rescues till the very end. It is three to two. Matt K in the lead. Question seven over to Justin. Name the actor who starred in St. Elmo's Fire... The Outsiders, and Free Jack. Oh, it's Emilio Estevez. Wow, he nailed it. No questions there. He ties the game three to three. Last question, Matt, you can win it on a walk-off or give Justin a chance to steal this one. Here it is. Kevin Klein played an American president in Dave, circa 1993. Which actress played his wife in the film? Oh, man. Okay. So Kevin Klein was the alliteration. So I don't have to find an alliterative name here for the Very answer. Very good. Yeah, you're doing really good. <laughs> and I believe she was also um, Dana in Ghostbusters, Sigourney Weaver. Matt wins this one four to three. Well done. Can I get a virtual handshake here, yeah. guys? Oh, virtual, virtual fist bump. There you go. Wow. There you go. Uh, if it came down to a tie, a real jawbreaker, we did something different this week. These three questions would have been over to Justin. All we need is true or false, it, real, real movie or fake. I'm going to give you a, a movie title. You tell me if it's a real Steven Seagal movie or not, okay? Love it. Up first, the movie Kill Switch. That's a real movie. That's right, it was. Came out in 2008. Second one, <laughs> Death Dive. That's not a real movie. He's on a roll here. That one's false. The third one, Force of Execution. <laughs> I wish it was a real movie. I don't think it is. I need to see it, though. I'm going to make that movie. <laughs> That one what? is a real movie. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> what does it even ex mean? Force of Execution came out in 2013. It's been billed as a Seagal masterpiece. It sounds like a mistranslation of a European film. <laughs> <laughs> like they just Google translated the title. What was, what was the first false one? Death Dive. Death Dive. So it's I'm, like a, a haunted like swimming pool or something? What? It sounds great. Force of Execution. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a, a death metal band called Force of Execution, and the first album is gonna be called Death Dive. <laughs> <laughs> the real jawbreaker was this age of Steven Seagal. Closest to Matt, do you got a guess on Mr. Seagal? I, you know, Steven Seagal, man. He he was at one time one of the most respected names in martial arts, 
and the mighty have fallen. <laughs> that's a true. That's absolutely true. It's hard to debate that statement. That sounds um, like a force of execution. <laughs> <laughs> His career is. Um, Hard to Kill is one of my favorite movies. So, okay, Steven Seagal's got to be 62 years old. 62. Lock him in at 62, Phil. Justin, you got to guess. Uh, much like Chuck Norris, Steven Seagal is immortal. <laughs> that, is, that is correct. Yeah. <laughs> I got it wrong. If you look it up on IMDb, it just says immortal. It's, it's a little it's forever. Amazing. forever. Yeah. It's we don't remember when he got here. He was just here. He's always but, been here and he'll always be here. Yeah, but I've looked into the man's eyes and he is 68 years old. Oh, 68 for okay. Mr. Seagal. So we'll give that one to Justin. Thank you, everybody. He's definitely closer to immortal than 62. <laughs> Oh, man. A lot of fun here. A lot of fun. I needed this after uh, a crazy week, an intense week. And uh, first and foremost, we got to thank our guest, Justin Zimmerman. Thanks for coming on Cinema Jaw. I really appreciate being here. And and thanks for talking about the the books and the movies. You guys are the best. Matt, we also got to thank our sponsors. Yeah. Thanks to Overcast and the Chicago Podcast Co-op who help us get great sponsors like them. Also got to thank our editor, the guy inside the fish tank, Phil Me and Phil. Oh, yeah, of course. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. And I did look it up. And Colin Hanks was in Jumanji The Next Level. He was also in the the first of the Jumanji reboots. And you might not know this, but his father is Tom Hanks. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Awesome stuff. If you want to support Cinema Jaw, the easiest way to do so is by leaving us a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And while you're at it, please click subscribe. One extra button for you helps us out tremendously. Until next week, I'm Ryan the Movie Guy. I'm Matt Kay. And keep on John about the movies. movies.